childhood, I was trying to find my family because whenever I saw whatever mechanical object, I have to open it, look inside, try to figure out the mechanism behind the function. Table clock were actually my favorite victims. Once I grew up, I realized that uh, table clock were not that much interesting. And for this reason, I shifted my attention to cognitive processes. So, during uh, the study of my in, during my career as a neuroscientist, I always tried to combine the study of anatomical basis of the brain function. For some organs, it's very easy to identify which the function is. Have a look to this cute dog. Do you expect him to run without prosthetic legs? I bet you don't, because you realize no structure, no function. But what's about the brain? What's the function of the brain? So it's easy to say that the function, the most peculiar function of the brain is mind. If we can uh, fall in love, read a book, uh, get wrong or right decision, it's just because we have anatomical structure in the brain which are working for it. Now, we can study anatomical structure by the means of at least two different levels. We can study this by the means of macroscopic scale that is everything you can see with your own eyes. It's brain size, gross anatomy feature. On the other hand, we can approach the study of the anatomy by the means of microscopic scale, in which we will underline the cells which are in the tissue, in this case, principally neurons, and the connection between neurons, which are called synapses. Now, if you want to indicate someone which is very smart, you call him or her brainy. So you want to say big brain. You are using macroscopic scale, macroscopic approach. Now, if or whether the macroscopic scale can justify the different level of intelligence that are in the mammals, for instance, will be the topic of the talk of today. Now, let's have a look to different mammals' brains here. So, you will be probably surprised by the fact that a giraffe has a big brain, as big as the human one. But you will be probably more surprised to see that two mammals' brains, at least, are missing here. In particular, we will see that if the human brain is around 1.5, 1.8 kilos, the elephant one is up to 6 kilos, and the sperm whale is up to 9 kilos. Wow, that's huge. We said that the uh, structure will cause a function. So, bigger brain, probably, bigger intellectual capabilities. But how many sperm whale, giraffe or elephant have you seen giving TED talk discussing human brain's dimension? Probably few, right? I hope, at least. <laughs> and the reason is because someone can say, well, don't try to be funny, because it's true that they have a big brain, but they have also a huge body. So, for this reason, scientists propose the brain-to-body-weight ratio. And now things start to work. The brain in humans is about the 2% of the total, uh, total body weight. The elephant one is uh, actually smaller because it's 0.5% and the sperm whale is just 0.02%. This is even more evident when we have a look to the infantilization quotient, which means uh, how the brain, the, the dimension of the brain is uh, in relation to what expected for the given body size. So you must have a brain which is eight times bigger than expected and the elephant, a brain which is half size than expected for the body weight. Sperm whale has 90% lighter brain than expected. 
So now things start to work. And we can say, well, it's true that uh, we have, uh, uh, on a macroscopic scale, uh, or relative, uh, relatively to body, it's true that can account for the differences in cognition. But what's about when we are not talking, as we have done until now, on animals which have different order of magnitude in the body weight? What happens when we are talking about humans, interspecies? Well, if uh, we have a look to the body weight of Lord Byron or Oliver Cromwell, we can think that, uh, yes, intellectual people can be with brainy, with a bigger brain, 2.2, 2.3. But it's, uh, something is challenging this concept. When we discover that two Nobel laureates in the 1921, actually Albert Einstein and Anatole France, got half-size brain to Lord Byron. You can be a Nobel laureate with a half-size brain than another man. Not bad. And, uh, but can we say that Lord Byron is twice intelligent than Albert Einstein? Of course not. And what's about when you discover that Neanderthals has a bigger brain than Homo sapiens? It's almost 100 grams more than Homo sapiens. So it's now clear and evident that the macroscopic scale cannot account for differences in intelligence in humans. If uh, so, we have to shift from macroscopic scale to microscopic scale. And uh, to go deeper in this uh, topic, I need uh, an example from a French colleagues in 2007 that we will see later on. Now, the fact that macroscopic scale is not sufficient to justify intelligence is something that uh, we can discuss today. But more than one century ago, it was not that clear. Actually, in 1796, a German physician, Franz Joseph Gall, proposed a theory called phrenology, in which he proposed that brain size, skull size, will be in direct correlation with the intellectual capabilities. Well, Franz Gall say that women are inferior to men just because they have a lighter brain. Unfortunately, it was too late for him to discover, post-mortem, of course, that his own brain was just 1.198 grams, much less than many women. So, actually, he was right. The female brain is smaller than the male one. It's around 10 per, about 10% lighter. But if in the past it was just defining a superiority, inferiority in intelligent skills, it's nowadays on agreement on neuroscientists, of cognitive neuroscientists, that male and female will have just a different type of intelligence. If it's true that uh, male do excel in a special perception in 3D reconstruction of uh, complex ob object in the space, uh, and they are performing back, uh, better in working memory, it's also true that women do have a better verbal task capability, they do excel in fine motor coordination, and uh, they are much better retrieving, retrieving uh, long-term memory items. That's probably why they always remember anniversary, and we don't. <laughs> it's not our, our fault, it's just our brain. So, as I said to you in advance, in order to understand really how the microscopic scale can afford the cognitive capabilities, we need to go back to a case report. This 44-year-old man admitted to MRI for headache was surprising medical doctor because, as you can see here, the cerebro -cere uh, cerebrospinal fluid that is inside cavities in the brain was 
enlarged. There was a lot of fluid in the brain, and the cortex and the cerebral tissue was very tiny. Actually, it was expected to have a brain of 400 grams. How this is possible? How is it possible that this man, this subject, was in any case with a quite average intelligence? He was working in a tax office. He was married with two children. To understand how it's possible, we have to look how the brain is developing. So let's get an example from the botanic world. If you have a tree and you want to make it more fruitful, you need to prune it. When you prune, he will become most, more fruitful. And what's about the brain? It's the same. We always think that we need more neurons or more synapses, but actually it's the opposite. We reach the plateau of the number of neurons at 18 months, 100 billions, but then we are losing at least 30, 40, up to 50% of them during lifetime, but we are not becoming less intelligent, actually. And what about synapses? Well, actually, the plateau of uh, synapse is reached at 10 years. But for the onset of the puberty, we already have lost 40% of them. We should consider that the number of neurons and the number of synapses is larger than optimal at the beginning. We need a bigger number, and then we need a pruning process, which is making a fine tuning of the, bra of the brain. Who is making this uh, fine tuning? The environment where the brain is interacting with. Now, coming back to our subject, French subject, how is it possible that he has just 75 less mass brain and he's quite average intelligent? It's because the survival neurons were still inside working circuitry. They perfectly know to which other neuron talk and what to say, because they were fine-tuned during life. This process is a continuous process. I will make you an example. What can you see here? Can you see anything? Okay, it's a cow. And now, will you succeed not to see any longer the cow? You're laughing. That means, no, I cannot. Why you cannot? Because I change your brain with a cow. And uh, I'm sorry to say, I did not make it bigger, but I just made a fine tuning of the existing synapses. This is what we are doing. We change continuously our brain, but not in size, not at macroscopic level, but at the microscopic level. Coming back to the difference between male and female. Well, we say that the male have a bigger brain, but what's about a microscopic level? At macroscopic level, we see that they have we have, actually, more neurons in the cortex than female. And each neuron has more synapses. But now we learned that this is not meaning that it's a better brain, but it's just a less refined brain, or refined in another way. So the two different brains are good brains for what they should do in the environment and they are shaped. Now, I think that now it's much easier for you to understand that the differences in brain size also in ethnic group doesn't mean anything. The fact that Caucasian has a bigger brain than other ethnic group, it doesn't mean at all that they are or we are more intelligent. Because we have seen now that intelligence is based on macro microscopic level. So, synapses. Again, 
I want to conclude with, uh, this is my brain. I want to share my brain. It's pretty big, unfortunately, because it's like Neanderthal. And uh, as you can see, I have a pretty big hippocampus. Hippocampus is, is required for spatial navigation. Well, I get lost in my hometown. So again, there is no correlation at all with the function. So summarizing, my take-home message is uh, that macroscopic scale does not account at all with intelligence. We cannot do anything to change the shape, the size of our brain, but never mind. It's nothing to do with intelligence. What we can do is just interact continuously with uh, the environment to challenge our brain, our synapses, with interesting discussion, attending TED talk, or getting, uh, watching a movie or whatever, interacting with environment. So keep on shaping your and our brain. Thanks. <laughs>